Hi, welcome to this episode of Harold Cuffey's weekly interviews. Today we've got a guest who is interested in Goan culture and heritage, and he does a lot of work for Goan heritage structures, and he is also a senior faculty in Goa College of Architecture. Please welcome Mr. Vishwesh Kandulkar. Welcome to this show, and I'm glad that we can talk about the things which you are so passionate about. The manor houses or the architectural heritage is both, maybe. First, uh, please tell us about uh, the exhibition that you have done recently, the uniqueness of Goan architecture. Uh, I would like to know the uh, curatorial idea uh, or the themes that you have put that exhibition in, if you can please elaborate. Uh, first of all, thank you for Harald for having me here to speak and thank you for Nilankur for uh, inviting me for this talk. Um, the uniqueness of Goan architecture, uh, the topic came from the Lusophone festival ideas and okay. they decided that we need to curate one uh, exhibition mm -hmm. which was largely meant for people who are coming from the Lusophone world. Okay. And Lusophone world, as you know, is largely po Portuguese speaking and where India is very much part of it because of Goa. Yes. Now, this usually when we speak about Goan architecture, Mm. The category in which it is categorized is falsely said only as Portuguese. And therefore, the term Goan architecture about Goa and Goa's identity does not get fully reproduced or represented uh, in this in these dimensions. Got it. So the idea about making a uniqueness of Goan architecture was to like some make a category of Goa more stronger than simply as Portuguese. For as you know, because of real estate, mm -hmm. second homes and yeah. many other things, people yeah. want to come and search for Portuguese houses. Mm. And they want to think that just because 451 years there were Portuguese here, the houses here are Portuguese, which is not true. Mm. They're very much Goan. Because there were a lot of influences have come, the Indian influences has come together? Yes. Yes. That is yes. How, yeah. So, uh, so th partly that was the reason why curatorial idea was to, how can we speak about Goan architecture and what can we show mm. in this whole whole palette of things. Mm. So one of the things of course is the historic architecture of buildings of yes. Goa. Yeah. So which means we have for example the World Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site which is marked uh, in Old Goa including Basilica Bone Jesus, Se mm. Cathedral, mm. St. Francis of Assisi among others mm. are amazing examples of a particular style of architecture which came in Goa. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly the city is no more the city is gone down and went down way back in around 70th century onwards. But part of the reason that we wanted to showcase was that of course we want to showcase the history of old Goa, the city itself, the architecture of old Goa, the monuments there mm. which are there and we have amazing collection of Sosa and Paul mm. photograph from 1890 which showcases the monuments in black and white photography, okay. quite nice. Okay. So we included those among mm. some of the archival plans of old Goa as a part of the exhibition. Mm. But firstly uh, I would like to say that this particular curatorial idea, although uh, I was part of the curator, there's a whole team which was there. So each okay. members of the team were having different sections mm -hmm. which were mm -hmm. looking at different parts. So we start with like, for example, we had Old Goa, which yes. was curated one part. But there was also city, mm -hmm. which was Mapsa. Mm -hmm. There was uh, Margam. Mm -hmm. And then we said, let's also look at religious architecture to some extent because there is amazing temples, mm. very much Goan, yes. amazing mosques, yeah. ama very much Goan. In fact, I had a, I was with historian Helder Karita yesterday mm -hmm. and we were looking at old maps and there is in, for example, in uh, even in Sankalim, there was an amazing mosque which was there. Sada? Not oh. Safa Masjid, okay. Safa Masjid is in, Pon uh, okay. in Ponda, but okay. this was another Mishkit in Sankalim. It's okay. there in Suzanne Paul. Mm. Very simple sloping roof structure, structure which you don't find in anywhere else. It doesn't okay. have a dome, it's just sloping roof. Manglo tiles mm. and very much looks like a Goan mosque. Mm -hmm. So the point that we were trying to make through all this thing is saying that no, it, whether it's religious architecture, whether uh, it's uh, palaces or this thing, they're all very much Goan. Mm. And therefore really trying to promote this whole idea that the Goan architecture is a category by itself. So that was the idea behind curating uh, various things within that. Yeah, it's great that you are going to establish that uh, the concept of Goan architecture again into the forefront then. then uh, Professor, I would like to know, how do I call a uh, Goan house now? Do I call Indo-Porto, like how people are saying, or I will say Goan, which will be more appropriate? What would you say? Uh, they, there are terms which are coined 
for business purpose for promoting real estate for instance and they are they call them simply as portuguese okay. and which is not correct so they're right. not mm. the term indo portuguese architecture mm -hmm. came much later in fact that the name didn't come when the buildings were being done in the 16th okay. and 17th century okay what and parola varela gomes historian mm. Mm. Uh, he wrote a very nice book called uh, whitewash red stone mm. whitewash is the whitewashing of the churches with a limestone and, and uh, okay. yeah, with, yeah with a lime plaster and everything okay. and yes. the red stone is actually the laterite stone okay so buildings which were really soaring the skies mm. Mm -hmm. but also they were built in laterite which if you know is a porous stone it's not a, the yes. strongest stone it is yes. not granite yeah it is not marble True. and yet you were trying to do uh, mm. amazing art and mm. architecture with and this stone huge walls also huge right. volume yeah. including doing mm. large walls etc so yes. that it's a great and i was reading a article that day of uh, for example pen name masons okay and they're very skilled masons so we don't when we think about architecture we only think about style Yes. But we don't think about the people who work behind this and in this case masons. Yeah. So it's are those local masons, Goan masons who yeah. were the building these things. So when you think about who are building these monuments, mm -hmm. very much Goan uh, people, you also start thinking like, you know, is it style is only thing that you want to talk about which is baroque or yeah. um, renaissance? Yeah. We also want to talk about the people who behind it. So in that sense this monuments truly belong to Goa and Goans. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them who have given their blood and uh, sweat to these buildings yes. and which is why we need to celebrate them as goan architecture so yeah. indo portuguese is a good term but not necessarily captures the the uniqueness of goa got it it is important because it is it speaks about confluence of two influences yeah. very much konkan yes. very much uh, european because yes. portuguese is not it's european yeah, but east and west yes, yes kind of definitely. thing yeah. but goan would be the uh, more uh, suitable title for this so i've got two questions uh, after hearing that after hearing from you about those black and white photographs can people still go and see it in central library somewhere uh, where are they archived or uh, again once again uh, very good question souza and paul studio uh, something which is very close to my study and which is where i look at uh, for example old pictures yeah. of of uh, basilica yes so this is this is the cover image which was which went uh, for it okay what's so good about the souza and paul pictures mm -hmm. uh, was that this were again souza and paul very much goan mm -hmm. established studio in 1884 mm -hmm. and they were clicking these pictures as a way of documenting and recording it to some extent but also these monuments were being sold and being so a lot of people had this you no know, just like the way you want to go to a place and have a souvenir yes. you take the pictures of this and go away yeah and uh, there were a lot of expositions which were happening for which this uh, this pictures were being sold so to us answer your question directly mm -hmm. yes in fact if you go to central library and ask them for susan paul collection okay. they are very much there okay and we have i think so we have to uh, laud the efforts of central library goa mm -hmm. and archaeology mm -hmm. because many of the archival thing in fact one we have one of the best libraries if i may say so yes, yes. for research yes. and they have the resources mm. for paying some nominal charges any ordinary citizen of goa or anybody True. else can go and uh, source them okay. they they are available yeah. they have album yeah. you can pick and choose and they'll they'll give it to you so similarly when you we were talking about the masonry the skills of goan guys who were making those gigantic Uh, buildings do you think uh, that is a family tradition going on for years can we trace them also somewhere that skill or it is completely lost what is your views on this there are two views on two views on this one one view is that to see it like a family tradition and think of it and as frozen and you want to link it to the to the lineage of yes, the family that is what i was going to say. so on one hand there are this uh, kind of exercises when we want to go and say like you know when there is modern education available when there is prosperity available when there is there are ways of modernizing everything is possible then why not modernize so i am not one of those people who would like to nostalgically just skip some traditions because they are uh, they are not part and parcel of the thing by the same time there are ways of incorporating this into very much uh, practice everyday practice got it what happens is that when we have easy solutions mm -hmm. of concrete mm. fast moving things mm. or we have a ideology and something which is made fam famous saying that okay flat roof mm. and uh, rcc structure is something mm. which you want to 
idealize, mm. then you will al obviously lo lose the tradition. Got it, got it, yes. Idea is to uh, incorporate normal practices into our building and mm. those things, there are, in, there are people who are doing it. Mm. Um, Talula, mm. Silva, yes, yeah. Hyacinth Pinto, yeah. to name a few. Yes. Got and it. there are many more who are okay. doing it and I think so it's, it's fair enough that people, people should be able to uh, choose and pick some of this material. So, uh, when we are talking about masonry, uh, there must be some vernacular architecture also. I was reading about vernacular architecture of a theatre and you have done your PhD in the bomb Jesus about this issue. Please tell us something about the vernacular architecture to start with. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I was reading something interesting that how the plasters they remove in Bob Silica to make it look old. Okay. So, uh, this is an interesting story. There are two questions in it. I'll answer mm. the first one, yeah. which is about vernacular architecture. Mm -hmm. By definition, vernacular architecture, vernacular is a term which said that whatever didn't fall into classical styles, mm. whatever was not classical, monuments were doing, mm. Gothic, Baroque, mm. Renaissance, so mm. all those are classified, yeah. recognized, and mm. they get like stamp of being some kind of stylistic. Yeah. Now, all the other buildings, which are buildings built by people, for mm. people, their own use, gets mm. categorized as what is called vernacular. So, it's like mm. a Mm. In architecture, it's like a, how do you say, you want to separate class. Yeah. And it's, it's like not B, class yeah, B. class A, class B. Yeah. Which is not fair because mm. many of the valuable learnings come from vernacular architecture. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, one of my, now he's a professor, but ex-student uh, of architecture college, Noah Fernandes, he went about looking at Dhangar houses. Mm -hmm. And he was searching for Dhangar houses and the Noah was very keen to, he had a bike which was like broken down, going around in the interiors. Mm -hmm. And he found some amazing Dhangar houses. Mm. One of them was in, of Bowden, okay. uh, which are there in Kepe, mm -hmm. in the interiors of Kepe. Mm -hmm. It is so interesting that some of these architecture practices they're doing is very much thing exactly that you want to talk into now mainstream because climate change is important. They're saying build local, social material within one kilometer of your, or two kilometers of your things. And these are the people who, who are very much practicing what is being now becoming a classroom kind got of it, architecture. So, yes. uh, people practice vernacular mm. architecture mm. and they are meant for environment, but they do not get recognition. Mm. So, Bowden mm. House is one of the examples mm. in Kaure and Kepe, very mm. good example. Mm. And those houses are amazing because if you go inside the houses, the mm. temperature is almost four degrees less. They are made of local hay and everything else. So, that's the amazing part of it. And there is second tradition of vernacular here and one of them I, uh, again, Mm. Now she is a professor, Rita Vaz. Yes. And uh, earlier she was a student when she was doing it, and mm. Amita Kanekar was a guide in that mm. topic. Mm. But it was amazing that when we think about rapidly assembled architecture for a moment of that uh, theatre, which is going to mm. be stage, yes. one day, two day in front mm. of the church. Mm. So what we do is that we have a stage, mm. we have the lighting, mm. and we have a tent like structure which comes mm. up. Mm. Now, for an ordinary person, when they look at the thing, saying that there is nothing much into it, mm. but there is a whole line of assembly of people coming, putting the structure, bring it, taking it out, and we, when we think about it, that structure changes the way of the way in which the ground is operating. Yes. It creates that clo cozy, closed environment mm. Mm. where you can totally submerge yourself in this theater mm. that you special theater. So, while theater, theater yes. has got a yeah. lot of audiences, yeah. I think so the architecture, mm. the the temporary stages. Mm putting together of bamboo and mm. uh, materials together has mm. created a unique architecture and we need to like also recognize record mm. and done that and Rita was, was one of them who were doing it. Following up on that, uh, before you go to Bob Jesus, uh, do you teach your students about uh, these Bowden houses, the, this vernacular architecture that like to preserve it, to work more on it? Yeah, uh, sure. I think so. it's a very good question and very important one for Goa College of Architecture. Uh, we did, uh, in fact, one of the things we did in the new syllabus is brought in a subject which is called vernacular architecture. Very good. So, in yeah. the second year semester, students mm. do have vernacular architecture. Mm. And some of these students, in fact, Noah Fernandez mm. is taking the subject now. I okay. did teach for some years, okay. uh, bringing the value of mm. uh, not classical architecture but vernacular architecture mm. to them. Mm. So, that subject did come in the college. Mm. It is being taught, mm. but more can be done, of course. And a lot of our research students who do research on some of these topics, okay. and it can, again, we need to create more. Uh, awareness about it and, and bring it into mainstream discussions. Um, yes, please guide them. No, sure. <laughs> yeah. But I think so, once in the, in the school, the mm. students have awareness, they have the recognition, mm. it's just that it is not enough spoken about and they have okay. the value. Okay. So, 
the part of the curatorial process of thing was then to say that to make it into a category saying that Goa does have amazing array, amazing specter, amazing examples of vernacular architecture. We need to recognize them mm -hmm. and celebrate them to some extent, but also then they are not meant to s celebrate it romantically. I'll give an example. Okay. There was this whole thing about bunga houses in mm -hmm. Kutch and there was a romantic idea that bunga houses requires to be documented and Sept University at the time documents them. Mm -hmm. But what eventually happens is that people who are sit living in the cities, they mm -hmm. feel that they need to experience the village. Mm -hmm. So they start, they start popularizing this vernacular architecture because you want to experience something different that you're not used to in the cities. So vernacular architecture mm -hmm. goes and takes a form of becoming a fantastic uh, hotel. So you have Bunga reproduce. Okay. So the idea is even when you want to reproduce them, you mm. are reproducing them for touristic consumption. Yeah. Then it becomes a false narrative. It's not for people. You know, you are not going and living amongst the people. Got it. The point I'm trying to make is that vernacular architecture is not vernacular if those people who are using them are not part of the story. Mm. So oftentimes, as it happens with Goa mm. and Goan people, mm. the stories gets popularized, romanticized, mm. but the people themselves go missing. So for mm. example, mm. Indo-Portuguese architecture of Goan house is celebrated, but some perhaps some rich person from Delhi who doesn't have mm. that connection to the place mm. is sitting there or mm. on the other hand there's somebody their whole place has become a resort mm. that value of Indo Portuguese architecture is lost because it's not part and parcel of our lived life totally so mm. in that sense I think so the the Goans themselves are very much part of the story of Goan architecture mm. so this exhibition was really curated for students and for uh, people mm. who could really go and see their own houses yes. their own things yeah, as own a part heritage, of thing yeah. because it was going in a gallery and when mm. things go in the gallery mm. whatever is there in the gallery you think it's being celebrated so mm. trying to bridge that gap and to some extent we need to go more towards people by taking this architecture yeah forward. kind of letting people internalize the heritage internalize the no? heritage that, that's good yes we can come back to bomb jesus <laughs> why did they remove the plaster bomb jesus uh, basilica bomb jesus is an amazing story of uh, saint francis xavier's relics mm -hmm. it's amazing story of goan architecture it it kind of encapsulates everything which is happening with goan architecture historically yes the building was built i mean mm -hmm. i don't want to talk about huh. history but building was built in almost 16th century mm -hmm. and it is not a, like a great building it didn't have like mm -hmm. if if you if you ask me architecturally mm -hmm. a sacred cathedral is far more okay far more better intriguing intriguing yeah. but because the relics of saint francis Xavier is, is kept in this thing it was shifted in 1624 mm. in fact uh, it'll be 400 years in 24 mm. that it has been shifted so it's a big time to celebrate mm. and that shift kind of connected the building's history with that of Xavier's biography okay and that connection that goans were going every year it's like you're going and renewing your love story with a building and your favorite saint true and it it gets repeated so what happens in in 1952 mm. part of the many expulsions were happening mm. 1952 comes at a time when india is already independent yes and there is a big um, political rift between, between salazar and nehru yes so at that time the political um, political environment. ideas environment between yeah. that is to show that this place is special mm. so they want to show this place as special and in that story in that exposition there's a famous uh, one of my uh, colleagues in Portugal, Joaquim Santos, mm -hmm. has done a lot of research on that, looking at how was this expo uh, the restaurants mm. employed in Goa. So he was a very famous, Baltazar Castro was a very famous person, head of what is their uh, conservation program in okay. Portugal, okay. and having done a lot of restorations in Portugal. It is like Archaeological Survey of India, uh, similar? Uh, similar but not same. Okay. Archaeological Survey of India is, has a parallel story and okay. it's not uh, All right. this thing. But similar but not same. So they get mm. him. Yeah. And what he was doing there is similar. So what mm. Portugal is doing in Portugal mm -hmm. is because it's competing with the other powers. the like British, Spain. Spain, yeah. British. France. The maybe. Dutch, France. Yeah. And they all are, it's a period of decolonization, but yes. it's also a period of holding on to your powers. Yes. The only way Portugal can say that, you know, we are a, uh, amazing country is trying to show we are a great country which is having a great past mm. and the great past you want evidence mm. and this evidence sometimes there are books you mm. can say that okay here is a manuscript saying portugal blah 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 blah, mm. blah. but here are the mm. monuments which belong to a particular period mm. and monuments become far more 
powerful symbols, mm. evidence, mm. which you can say people this is old. Mm. So what Baltazar was doing, and Joaquin mm. Santos has mm. more work on it, mm. is trying to make them as older than they were. So even in Portugal, he's trying to make it aged, make it, it older, yeah. trying to showcase the older legacy of Portugal. So when they Got come it. here, yeah. they want to do something similar to, so the idea behind removing the plaster, they remove the plaster of the basilica, mm. and then they they looked at the basilica and saying there is it looks more older than it is mm. and because everybody would come to basilica there would be queues mm. see it and go away mm. it becomes a monument which where it becomes a, a part and parcel of telling the story mm. so in 19, leading up 1952 mm. Baltazar Castro orders to remove of the plaster mm. two buildings mm. among which is uh, renovated one is Viceroy's Arch okay another one is uh, Basilica of Born Jesus mm. it's removed but what happens after one rains, the mm. Viceroy's Arch, because the plaster is removed, it collapses. Mm. Uh, that's not the same story about the silica, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the power of saint or among other things. Mm. But we can really see the deterioration happening there. Okay. And I spoke to, in fact, I had a talk with Helder Carita and some other uh, scholars. I spoke to them, what is the logic behind it? So he mm. said that the laterite stone, when exposed to air, becomes stronger. That's what okay. Balthazar came to understand of, of archaeology. Right. But what he didn't understand is the rain. Mm. Mm. That in tropical mm. country, yes, mm. it gets this thing, but every year it will get wet mm. and again it will dry. Mm. And so you'll have a way in which after every monsoon, mm. you'll have a stone which is which is losing its small, small amount. Creepy, it's yeah, chipping away. So what they say, I mean just to, mm. what they say is that it's like a the plaster, which is a lime plaster, which mm. breathes. Mm. That's a kind of a plaster which is a sacrificial layer. So I'm not saying that. It's meant to deteriorate. And it meant and to be then meant to be every year. So this whole yeah. process of mm. of renewing the building every year, it's not a permanent solution. Like a lot of people think that, okay, yeah. uh, I will plaster it and it might look fantastic. Mm. No, it might mm. look terrible. It might, mm. But that's the one which is going to take the beating. Got Stone it. will be protected, which is a structural member. Yes. So yeah. it's a story. But it's an amazing story of a time, which mm. is addition, which is taken. And I think so a lot of people uh, understand this. Mm. In fact, I've spoken to a lot of people who are in the... Uh, lay people, in fact, mm. Father Patricio, uh, who was kind enough, there was a talk. We went to speak to the uh, to the people who had gathered their volunteers of the basilica, mm. coming all the way from Cancun. This thing, mm. some of them were saying, it doesn't matter. We want our basilica protected. For them, the aesthetics of the basilica is not so important as the basilica itself. Got it. And that's the story of the basilica, which is uh, which is quite. Uh, it's sure multi-layered. Multi-layered. Like, yeah. Also, Marjorie. I was thinking when you were telling me about how they age it, I was thinking about how they do the carbon dating for the trees or yeah. stuff. I was thinking it can be used by the environmentalists to show that this tree is old, you know, please don't yes. cut it. Yes. <laughs> Reversely, I was thinking. No, there's, there's an interesting connection here. Yeah. What happens is that now, mm. and this is the part of the research that is being done, the rains are not the same. They are coming in more intensity. Nowadays, thought key which came. Like okay. So, only thing is, what is going to happen over time is that uh, tropical storms are going to become stronger because mm. of climate change, mm -hmm. and the rains are going to become very much intense. Mm -hmm. So, it's not the same. So, it's not that things in terms of every year monsoons are same. They're Got becoming it. more powerful and more intense. Mm. So, going back to it's not just the basilica, but going back to our heritage, we have to think more creatively in thinking what will happen to our heritage with environment uh, becoming more difficult. Right. Because it's, the buildings yeah. are old, yeah. they cannot be replaced. At the mm. same time, the environmental conditions are becoming worse. Yes. So the challenge, and this is the challenge across the world of heritage, true, you know, uh, ICOMOS and many other mm. uh, heritage uh, connected people are thinking about in terms of, in, in relation to climate change, mm. how do we think of our monuments? Got do we adopt new styles, new mm. things? How do we go about mm. doing those uh, protection yeah. of those monuments? So it's a big challenge. Yeah. I think we are coming to the end of the show. And uh, last question I have for you, that now that you teach the young students, you uh, you uh, you encourage, you guide a lot of young archi architectural students, and uh, and you do a lot of research on the heritage buildings and how to go forward now that you were saying because of climate change and stuff. So in this whole, uh, again, multi-layered cross currents of this, how safe are the heritage buildings? That is one. Secondly, in the discussion of floor space index from the real estate, which is coming massively in Goa. So uh, where is the connection? How do you 
see yourself in that equation? Um, okay, the first question. I think so young Goans are very much invested in their heritage. That's a they, great thing to hear. They are yeah. very much, uh, young Goans are very much aware of the thing. They're far more aware than, you know, perhaps. In fact, it's the other way around. I think the, the awareness that the students have, the awareness that Goans have, younger generation have, is far much more. So it's something which uh, have to be built upon. Mm -hmm. There has to be proper uh, platforms that we can provide. And at Goa College of Architecture, Technical Education, we have been continuously thinking about how do we, up, uh, you know, improve ourselves as teachers, as this thing to uh, match the students' thing. As far as architecture is concerned, it's a profession which is at uh, crossroads, I would say. Mm -hmm. Because on one hand, there's heritage. You think of how do we conserve the past. But on the other hand, there's development and this conundrum of trying to fight of how to move ahead and at the same, same time stay behind is a difficult one for students to sometimes yeah. match the two. It's like back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes there are there are ideas which are based on nostalgically for the past. Yes. And sometimes there is the idea of thinking about, oh, we'll do a great future because we want to stand out of being yeah. different. Yeah. I think so. What I want to send a message to, to kind of students is that for architects, maybe urban designers, there's a great responsibility to public. And there's a way that people deserve a better design where we can make their lives better. For example, mm -hmm. architecture is said to be a profession which has to do something that you function. Like a chair. Yes. A chair, you want to make it beautiful. Yeah. But you also want to make it make it functional. U utilitarian. If yeah. you don't yeah. if it doesn't if you can't sit into a chair, yes. then what's the use? Got it. Architecture is a profession which ties this thing together for space and for mm. buildings. So mm. these two are amazing things that uh, mm. students of architecture and young people who want to mm. look for things can come and come and uh, explore mm -hmm. where they want to do utility mm. and beauty. Yes. But at the same time, uh, why I'm saying responding to public is because like, look at a building like Kala Academy. Mm. Amazing building because Charles Korea had a particular vision yes. of bringing. Yeah. But it's also at that time, it was Bausai Bandurkar who was putting putting together the idea that we could have a cultural center which would be open to all. Yes. So I feel that buildings are not merely supposed to be beautiful and gated. Okay. Or buildings are not supposed to be you can have most beautiful buildings mm -hmm. and you can lock them behind uh, gates and you can nobody can use them mm. opening up in institutions and having a responsibility where people can then explore some of the things are great joys of architecture which we can have public buildings and public this thing so i think that's that's very okay. very critical for students mm. and they are they are doing it many of them are doing okay. it okay part two of your question which is um where do you see yourself <laughs> in this <laughs> No, so uh, I, see, I see myself, you know, so I oftentimes, and this is an uh, ongoing thing, there is a struggle uh, to teach because it's not always easy to, uh, there's ways in which you want to teach these things, but you also want to practice and write. Hmm. Uh, I think so the job of a teacher is increasingly difficult in the age where uh, attention is becoming difficult at the same time. But there's so many issues that you're going on that you don't know where to place your fingers on. I think so th right now the the role is to encourage young people, push them in research. Mm. There's so much to done, heritage, to be thought about. And Goa offers a unique opportunity because it's a special place. Mm -hmm. Historically, mm. Uh, locationally, yeah. uh, and the Goans, I think so there's so much which can be done. So I see myself promoting very much Goan studies program, focusing on Goa, focusing on Goan students, focusing on Goan people that it can become something where uh, we can all be proud of to create, really create uh, that legacy. And which is why I said the uniqueness of Goan architecture is a part of the curatorial thing. So that's yes. the whole thing that, you okay. know, we should celebrate uh, Goa. Yes. Great talking to you, Mr. Tendulkar, and uh, great having you here. And I hope the work that you are doing will inspire many, uh, many people and we'll get to see more of these exhibitions because it's better for the Better for us as Goans to internalize the heritage so that we can think of a progressive future, like how you have said. Thank you for your time. Thanks, and we'll see you next week again. Thank you.